My mother-in-law gave me a lovely kitchen timer. I think it was for purposes like this. So it'll save Rod dragging me off. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Rupert. I'm married to Amanda. We live in Limehouse. We're blessed with two little boys, Benji and Barney. Um, my uh, background is, is a mixture of law and church ministry. Um, uh, for a living, I spend a lot of time with media and technology companies doing legal consulting. Uh, and uh, in my background, I'm also ordained in the Anglican Church. So a bit of a mixture. Well, there's a couple of pig stories that come into this today. Did you hear about the pig farmer who came into the church office? He said, I want to see the head hog at the trough. And the church secretary said, I don't think that's a very polite way to refer to the minister. You should really call him reverend or rector or pastor. I don't think head hog at the trough is the right way to talk about him. Well, all right, said the farmer, but it's just that I've just sold a few hundred pigs and I was planning to make a £10,000 donation to, uh, to the church fund. Well, in that case, said the secretary, the big pig has just walked in. <laughs> so we're talking about generosity this morning, and in some ways there's nothing like our wallets or our purses to, to draw back the curtains uh, on the attitudes of our hearts. Um, by way of clarification, if you are visiting here today, please do not hear this as a talk by the church trying to get your money. This is a sermon about money, but it's not trying to get your money uh, if you're here and you're thinking, I'm not even sure what I think about church or about God or about Jesus. Um, but it's not possible to look at Jesus and to look at the Bible and not frequently come across the subject of money because Jesus spoke about it a lot because it does pull back the curtains on who we are and what our hearts are like. And also, just as an organization from time to time, we have to talk about money. Any organization does, whether it's a small one like your family or a big one like, I don't know, the government and in between, football clubs, golf clubs, churches. Uh, it's something we have to address. But today we're not addressing it for organizational reasons. We're addressing it because the Christian life is meant to be a revolutionary one and that's the, what this subject is about. And so the subject today is revolution in our generosity. And I hope that three things will come out of reflecting on Jesus' words today. The first one, that generosity actually starts with God and comes from God. Our generosity is never really our generosity. It's first of all God's. Secondly, our generosity should always be something that is freely given. We'll, we'll see as we reflect uh, in 2 Corinthians in a moment. Our generosity should be cheerful. In fact, the word that Paul uses is hilarious. Something that is given freely from a, an overflowing heart of joy. And, and lastly, generosity is something that leads to our personal growth. If we go to the gym and lift weights, we'll grow, maybe, in muscles, I maybe will one day. Um, if we are generous in our hearts, our hearts will grow. Let's pray for a moment, uh, and then we'll dive in. Lord Jesus, when we come to you, you pull back the curtains and let the light flood in. And we ask the light might flood in to our hearts this morning. We pray that you would walk out of the pages of Scripture into our hearts afresh. In Jesus' name, amen. So first of all, generosity is a gift of grace to us. It is God's grace towards us. And in that sense, it's a spiritual gift. In church, we talk about different types of spiritual gifts. Uh, and one of them, it turns out, is generosity. So think of the story we've just heard read to us about this widow she gave out of her poverty. It was extreme revolutionary generosity. It was a tiny amount, just two little coins. In, 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 uh, if you're a coin collector, these coins are called mites, little mites. They're the, small, the smallest denomination uh, that you can get. Um, and they're just worth a few pounds. Uh, but as far as Jesus was concerned, her gift was incomparably greater than the largesse of the wealthy who were giving around her because she was giving out of her poverty and not out of her wealth. So you've probably heard the story of the two chickens who went into a bar and they were complaining about the farmer at the farm. And one chicken says to the other, honestly, every day I do my best to give two beautiful eggs to the farmer for his full English breakfast. And what do I get for my generosity? Not even a thank you. Well, a pig is at the other end of the bar. He overhears their conversation. You wanna talk about generosity? When it comes to the full English breakfast, talk to us pigs. Well, obviously, the pigs give a lot more than the chickens. 
The widow gave out of her poverty. She gave everything. And Jesus is talking about the kind of generosity that hurts, the kind of generosity that is sacrificial. Uh, And these are challenging words. But why is he talking about the widow? Why is he reflecting on her? Is he holding her up as an example? This is exactly what we should do? Well, more so I think he's holding her up as a contrast against the rich, and particularly uh, the rich who are in office in the church or in the temple. So uh, in chapter 20, verse 46, he says, Beware of the teachers of the law, the scribes, the Pharisees, the vicars, maybe. They like to walk around in flowing robes. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplace. They devour widows' houses. These men will be punished most severely. A while ago, during the credit crunch, Goldman Sachs was described as a vampire squid with its tentacles wrapped around the world, sucking out uh, uh, the income of the poor. Now, that may or may not be fair, and I'm certainly, if you were working for or with Goldman Sachs, I'm not, I'm not making any comments, other than it's a vivid illustration. It caught the press's imagination. It's a vivid illustration uh, of, of a powerful organization uh, sucking wealth from the weak. Uh, but Jesus is saying, uh, those in authority in the temple, uh, they were living off the charity, not just of the, of the wealthy, but they were living off the charity of those like the widow who, who were uh, in at the base level of poverty. And so he's holding up this contrast uh, of those who live off the charity of others and and abuse them uh, and those who selflessly give beyond the measure of of normality, if you like. So so what are we to do with this widow? If If she's not a literal example for us, and in some ways I don't think she can be a literal example for us because if the rule was give everything that you've got to live on well you could only do it once and then you've given everything that you've got to live on and until you've got something else then you would give that we would all be in abject poverty obviously she's an example that is is lifted up and commended Uh, and it may be there are times where we should give you know everything we've got Uh, but but maybe uh, we will understand the message of generosity better as we put that in the context of the bible as a whole So it's often said the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. And so I want us to reflect a little bit on on, uh, what is maybe the sort of jewel in the crown of teaching about generosity, which is Paul's writing to the Corinthians. And he writes in the second letter uh, of the Corinthians in chapter 8, quite expansively about generosity uh, and makes sense of it for us. So he says um, at chapter chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians, verse 1, Uh, And it's up there on the screen. Brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace God has given the Macedonian churches. Now stay with me. Macedonia, where's that? We'll come to that in a minute. But the Macedonian churches, in the midst of severe trial, overflowing generosity, and extreme poverty, uh, they welled up in rich generosity. I testify that they have given as much as they were able, even beyond their ability. So the background, and I think we've got a map, is that... uh, And if the map doesn't, there we go. Macedonia is northern Greece. uh, And the churches uh, like Galatia, the the, the letter to the Galatians, the letter to the the Philippians, uh, that's the area of Macedonia. And Paul is writing to the south, to Corinth. Uh, And some years before, he had agreed with the disciples in Jerusalem that he would collect a major league, so that he would do a major league fundraiser and collect a donation from the churches of the Gentiles for the poor Christians in Jerusalem. So the the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem were suffering persecution and extreme poverty, and he he had said he would bring a donation, a gift from the Gentile churches um, over to the Jerusalem church. And so he's writing to Corinth, and he's saying, Corinthians, think about the Macedonians. We want you to know the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. The Macedonians are giving generously out of their poverty, but how are they doing it? They're not doing it out of sort of gritted teeth and obligation. They're doing it out of the grace that God has given them. And in that grace, they have found joy in their poverty and joy in the severe trials they're facing. No doubt the abuse uh, and the prejudice they're facing for becoming Christians. So in their joy, they are welling up in generosity. Later on uh, in in chapter 8, verse 7, Paul says, See to it that you, Corinthians, excel in this grace of giving. So he's challenging them. Be like the Macedonians. Excel in this grace of giving. Now, 
Here's a little, little, little bit of language to focus on. The word for grace is the word charis. And the word charis is the same word that Paul uses to describe the spiritual gifts uh, that are described in, the other, uh, in his other writings to the Corinthians. Now, the Corinthians were pretty extreme as a church. They were suing each other the whole time. Uh, they were broken up into divisive cliques. Some of them liked to follow the teaching of Paul. Some of them the teaching of Apollos. They were, they were all over the place. Sexually, they were a complete disaster. Uh, immorality, promiscuity, even incest were, were sort of applauded as being a, a, an acceptable way of living. But they were also spiritually uh, pretty, pretty proud. They were very keen on the more dramatic spiritual gifts or the dramatic spiritual charises, uh, gifts of knowledge, words of knowledge, gifts of prophecy, uh, gifts of speaking in tongues. Uh, and they were so taken up with these gifts that Paul had to write to them uh, in 1 Corinthians, the first letter to the Corinthians, uh, chapter 13, his famous wedding speech, or it's become his wedding speech, although it was never written to uh, an engaged couple. Uh, but he's writing, writing to them to say, look, you're so caught up in these wonderful gifts of prophecy and tongues and knowledge, but if you don't have love, they are nothing. You know the words, if I speak in the tongues of angels, if I have supernatural knowledge and prophecy, but I, I have not love, I am just a clanging symbol. And here he's saying, Generosity is a spiritual gift too uh, that should come to us out of the grace and love God has given to us. It's embedded in God's grace to us. So in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, we have maybe the sort of the heart of the matter. Verse 9 says this, You know the grace, the charis of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Though he was rich, he became poor, that you who are poor might become rich. Elsewhere, when Paul wrote to the Philippians, he said it like this. He said, Jesus made himself nothing. He took the very nature of a servant. He was made in human likeness. The one who placed the stars in space was made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he went even further. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. And not just any death, the worst form of death you can imagine, even death on a cross. He made himself nothing. He became poor that we might become rich. He became economically poor, socially poor. He was a Jew at a forgotten corner of the Roman Empire, a trodden down and abused. He became spiritually poor. He took our sin onto himself so that we could go free. He became mortally poor. He entered into the death of humanity, the source of all life, entered into the death of humanity that we could step back into life and be free from the punishment of sin that we deserve, to be free from the punishment of death and hell. So in every way, he became poor that we could become rich. And so that grace to us uh, should lead to grace from us, generosity from us. I spent a little time a, a few years ago visiting an orphanage in Mozambique, and it was an intense place. Uh, hundreds of kids, uh, a wonderful Christian ministry, one of several orphanages, and a, and a campaign also of planting churches up the coast of Mozambique. And the lady behind this ministry was called Heidi. And you know, she had a big job on her hands and had, at one point had burnt out from just giving and giving and giving and giving, serving these children, serving these pastors in these churches. And so she developed a new way of approaching her ministry. The first two hours of the day, I think between 9 and 11, she used to lock herself in her car and just come into the presence of God. Not with a long list of things to pray for, but just reflecting on the love and the grace of God, to seek intimacy with him. And she said that ever since she started that practice of giving, I mean, two hours is a bit extreme in the sense that it's not easy for all of us to do that, but in the way that she configured her life uh, and all of it was given to serving these children, then that's what she did. And she said from then on, she never got tired or burnt out because she was always able to draw on the resources of God's grace. So generosity comes from the grace of God and generosity, secondly, should be an act of free grace 
from us too. So Paul says at verse 8, he says, I am not commanding you. This is not a command. This is, this is an invitation. I'm, I'm soliciting you towards the grace of God that you might be generous. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, he says this, each of you should give what you've decided in your hearts, but not reluctantly and not under compulsion. There's not a law here that you must do X or you must do Y. You're not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a hilarious giver, literally. God loves a cheerful giver because he is a cheerful giver. He freely gave of himself. Now, the word cheerful in English is is a a little bit of a weak word. I'm cheerful. You know, it's not that strong. Maybe that's why the word hilarious is, is, is a better word. But, you know, it's full of heart and full of love. And we need to hear that because all of us have got a tendency uh, towards legalism. When I say all of us, I mean I certainly do. All of us like to be able to create tick boxes in life and, and tick them off or get badges. Now, if you follow software or internet development, one of the big things of the last few years has been gamification. So any, any sort of app you use or any website you use, they try and now gamify it so that you can get awarded a badge or some sort of little honor for having done You know, if you've got a running app, if you've done enough runs, then you'll get the badge for being the best runner in Limehouse or something like that. And we love collecting badges and ticking boxes because it makes us feel we've done the job. And when it comes to generosity, then we like to see if we can find a box to tick for that. Uh, And one of the boxes that we like to tick is maybe the box of tithing. I've given 10%. So I've I've done what I'm meant to do. I can feel relaxed or I can feel contented that I've done my Christian duty. Now, tithing was a principle and command for the Jews in the Old Testament. But here and through the New Testament, Jesus has blown that out of the water because he's saying, look, I don't want a box to be ticked. I, I want a response to my grace from your heart so that you might be like the Macedonians, you might be like that widow, you may be someone uh, who isn't you know, able to do those extreme acts of generosity at this point, but nevertheless you are able to freely give, expansively give, joyfully give, even in the midst of poverty. poverty. So he is not saying you must give everything, even, even though that widow was held up as an example, but he, he is saying we must give generously fr- from our very hearts. So we have a tendency towards wanting to create a box to tick, towards legalism, but we're free from that. I was reading, um, it's good news that we're free from that. While I was reading around this uh, subject, I came across an essay between two theologians. It was a kind of dialogue debate uh, on paper between two theologians. Should we give before tax or after tax? Should we tithe our gross or our net income? Now, once you start asking that question, I think Paul would say, look, I think you've already lost the heart of the matter. Um, One of the guys reflected, if I live in a socialist country with a very high tax rate and I give net, my tithing will be smaller. But if I live in a very sort of right-wing country with a small tax level, then, and I give net, then my tax will be larger. If I live in a country with an extreme tax rate of 100%, or even, let's say, 91%, and I give gross, and I have to give 10% of my income, well, I can't do it, because I've already had 91% of my income taken away. So you get locked up in in strange cycles and questions. But actually, A, we're free from that burden, uh, and in another way, we're invited into, well, a more exciting, I mean, maybe burden, but it's a more exciting journey, uh, and a deeper one. It's about the heart and not about ticking the box. Uh, And last of all, giving results in our growth. Sometimes maybe you feel as, as time goes by that uh, you know, you're, there's a sort of decay that can go on inside. You know, we sort of settle down and get into a routine. And that, and that sadly is the natural order of biology. I think it's called, somebody maybe can correct my pronunciation, but atrophy. That you know, Basically the law is we never stay static. If you get fit one day, the next day you're not as fit. Gradually we, we decay. We have to keep moving to be improving, and our hearts and our spiritual journey are the same. Uh, and this is you know, certainly something uh, that has convicted me and made me think as I've been preparing this. But as we give, as we are generous, then our hearts are re-energized, uh, if you like, with, with the spirit and the grace of God. Now, what that means is that uh, 
We grow, our wallets don't grow. So uh, you will find some churches uh, around, not far from here probably, but all around the world, that teach that as we give, our wallets get bigger. So you give to get. And it's called the prosperity theology. Uh, And it's taken from from verses like uh, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6, which which may come up, where Paul says, He who spares sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows generously will reap generously. In other words, if you give a lot, you'll get a lot. And there are churches that teach that. And, and when you take verses in isolation, you can see why they might teach that. But to teach that is to totally miss the point of the grace of God to us in Jesus. Because it, it turns giving into a sort of a selfish act of getting. The reason I give is so that I can get more. Well, what does that mean? It doesn't mean I'm worshipping God. It actually means I'm worshipping my wallet. I'm using God to get to my wallet rather than using my wallet to get to God. This is a wonderful gift from my mother-in-law. So so I'm going to stop. Yeah, thank you. Let me, I will stop with a summary, and then I'm going to show you a few slides of wonderful ways that can help us give. So the summary is, giving comes from God's grace. Giving should be an act of our grace, not our sort of legal obligation. And the wonderful thing about it is it helps us grow as people. It doesn't make us smaller. It might make us poorer, but it makes us bigger. Um, now, I've got some uh, slides of, of, of websites that have a look at as a practical way of thinking, well, how can I get going in giving or, or give in a different way? Stewardship, which is, we've mentioned a couple of times over this month. If you're finding it difficult simply just to get organized about giving, because leaflets for standing orders and things like that, and this is de- very much me, get lost in your, on your sort of kitchen table or something. Stewardship helps you organize all your giving from one place. You give to stewardship. If you're a taxpayer, they reclaim tax for you and add it to your gift and then you can distribute it to church or to any one of thousands of charities or, or Christian workers. Brilliant organization. Now, Stewardship for Lent are launching 40 acts. Lent, 40 days, 40 acts of generosity that we can reflect on doing during Lent. So it may be that I can't enter into a great big form of organized giving at the moment, but I can take one or two or 40 generous acts this Lent. 40 acts, something to think about. Here's an organization that's wonderful, International Justice Mission. Are you thinking, I'd love to give to my church, but I also want to give to something in the wider world. The International Justice Mission work to release people who are bounded in slavery in the developing world to to get them released from slavery. An amazing organization. Those are Christian organizations. Here are two organizations. They're They're not Christian, but they're great examples of interesting ways that we can give, and maybe will spur us to think of parallels. Uh, One is called Kiva. Kiva, you can give Kiva $20, and through Kiva, you can lend $20 to a farmer or a shopkeeper in Sudan or, I don't know, Uganda, India, help them grow their business. And then they pay the loan back. They have a 98% loan repayment. So you can give it, then you can get it back, then you can give it. I think a few few years ago, I think I gave, well, didn't give, lent lent $200 to Kiva, and it's still coming back and going round and around. And it's actually a lovely way of engaging with individuals uh, and the last of all, Watsi. Watsi has got a lot of press, if you read tech press, in the last few weeks. Watsi enables a crowd of people to fund an operation for one sick person in the developing world. So I think there's a picture up here of Enoch. Enoch has got a problem with uh, stunted ears. His ears never grew properly. He can, be, he can get an operation done to fix his ears, which I think costs $1,200. And that can be sourced from a few people around the world or a few hundred people around the world giving a few dollars. So there are things we can do, giving a small amount lots of times, giving a large amount occasionally, but there are exciting ways that we can give. And as Darren said last week, we can start small. The main thing is that we start. Let's pray.